I'm Zach Laws of Gold Derby here with three of the producers of uh, one of the year's most heroine and deeply personal films of the year, Anita Gal, Chris Leggett, and Danielle Taplin Lundberg. They're here representing Honey Boy, written and starring Shia LaBeouf, written by and starring Shia LaBeouf, directed by Alma Harrell. Uh, let me ask you guys, and, and all of you can jump into this at once. You know, this is such a, a, a deeply personal project uh, for Shia, both as a, a writer and a star. Uh, what was it like working with him on something that uh, was so close to his own life and his own experiences? Um, I'll start, and yeah. then you, you, you guys jump in. But um, when we, when I got the script, it was two years ago, January. Is that right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I had been told it was um, Shia's own personal um, writings of his own experiences with his father. And right away, I was like, "Well, that is fascinating and and so brave." And then we immediately read it over a weekend. And not only was it brave, but it was really, really some of the most excellent writing I had read in a really long time. And I think for me, that was the thing that really like made it worthwhile. It wasn't just like this self-indulgent piece where um, someone was complaining about his childhood. It was really um, this like accurately self-reflective um, story about someone's love for his father, but also his own personal demons. Um, and so I think like Shia's willingness to be honest um, and self-deprecating and funny and heartbreaking was the thing that I think draw, drew us all to the story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. It was just so singular. Yeah. No, no, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I was going to ask after that. I mean, what was the biggest challenge that uh, you guys faced in bringing this project to the screen? Um. You know, I think Anita and I right away, um, Shia was a little bit of a controversial figure, particularly two years ago, he was coming out of rehab. I think one of the biggest challenges could have been financing a film um, where he is playing the lead. Um, and I think Anita and I sat with him um, pretty early on and felt that he was really willing to commit and do the work and that this was something that he felt was going to save his own life. Um, and so the fact that he was willing to be so honest about that and expose himself in that way sort of gave us the confidence to come in and really um, back it financially. So that really didn't um, wasn't the issue because we sort of committed early. Um, but I would say on Chris's part, and I'll let you explain this. This was a very ambitious film. I think if you look at the first scene, it looks like it's a much, much bigger film than it actually was. And so mm -hmm. I think the physical yeah, requirements. I mean, I mean, Alma's an incredibly ambitious filmmaker, and I think she, she has the perfect blend of, of crazy and and knowing when to uh, hear things and knowing when to ignore things. And so, you know, it was constantly trying to figure out how to bring the scope and bring the scale and bring all the things that are fantastic off you know, when she, when Otis is on set and try to make that world as big and large as possible. Um, and so that's obviously a struggle when you're making an indie film. I think the other thing I was going to add to to your point, I think there was something really amazing when we started making this film. And I think everyone kind of felt that there was like, there was an urgency in Shia and everybody started to feel that, that this movie had to get made. It, it was, and I think it gave everyone trust that he was going to be there. He was going to do the work. He was going to, try to develop his relationship with his father. It was it was something in, in the screenplay. It was something in even leading up into pre-production before this was even financed. I think he was already starting to prepare for the role and you felt that and you were like, I I know if we get on board with this, we're gonna all be on this journey together. And I think it led its way to all of our amazing crew who brought I mean, we had people, we were shooting way beyond the stars. We had one of the most amazing cinematographers, Natasha Breyer, who brought her look. And I think everyone just felt that urgency and everyone, more than most films, I feel like, wanted to get on the ball and let that rock just start rolling faster and faster. I mean, once we got involved, I mean, from script to production, yeah. we were three months, yeah. four months. It, yeah. was, it was really, really fast. Yeah, it 
was a bit of a rocket ship. And I will say, like, Alma is one of these filmmakers, and not every filmmaker I feel is this is this way. She is unwilling to compromise. Yes. She's unwilling to compromise herself, and so she's unwilling to let anyone else compromise. Mm -hmm. And so the level um, with which everyone had to step up to was just, like, sort of beyond, I think, the traditional, like, independent filmmaking <clears throat> Um, level and so I mean I think it shows in the work and um, but that woman just like is her own toughest critic you know she'll Completely. work herself to the bone Completely. yeah yeah well, we'll talk a little bit more about it, and, and uh, Anita, maybe you can uh, speak to this uh, as well. Um, what made Alma Harrell, who's done a lot of documentaries um, in the past, but hasn't done a, a narrative feature film before, what made her the right person to do this, and, and how did uh, the decision get made to uh, involve her in it? I mean, I think to, to me and to all of us, there was nobody else who could have made this movie. And then to start with, you know, uh, Alma and Shia just already had such a trusting relationship with each other that they were you know such strong collaborators that they just understood each other intrinsically and um and alma's background you know on the one hand she'd done these two amazing feature documentaries um that were that were so sort of idiosyncratic and of her own style but at the same time she was such an accomplished director and filmmaker on the commercials and music videos these big productions that she's done too and i think this film allowed her to bring all of that together and really shine uh even though it was her first narrative film i don't think anybody could tell right yeah. it was her experience and also her approach to the actors her performers was like her approach to her mm -hmm. her documentary subjects so it was really intimate it was all mm -hmm. about capturing what was authentic what was in the moment um so it just it was just it just fed really organically into it. And I would say too that I think the thing about I I work a lot in documentary and I've worked with Alma for ten years now and the line of documentary and narrative is so blurry in in any way. And I think that you know when I when I would when we were making the documentaries I would pitch uh, her as I'd say you know a documentary you may think of it as a as a picture and what she's doing is a painting and I think that she uses and I think we she did this in in the film she really util, utilizes everyone's shared experience to put something that maybe even represents something more true than what actually you would document like fly on the wall style and i think it really worked amazingly in doc in, in this narrative because everyone brought a piece to of of them to the uh, to the film like it was not she knows how to come into the room with with what she wants to do and knows how to also lean into watching it pivot, just like a documentary, mm -hmm. and imposing the story and, and guiding and directing, but also knowing that sometimes the directing is actually leaning into where you see it's going and, right. and playing off that. And it really felt fluid. And I think the toughest part for her was needing to have so many collaborators because we had such a big crew and we were used to smaller things. But I yeah. think ultimately it actually just allowed us to do bigger things in right. scope. You can't blow up a, a 747 with three people on a C300. Like yeah. it's, a, it's a process that requires a lot more people. And I think it, was, it, it opened up her eyes. And I think I'm excited for the things that she wants to do next. I think that she's now goes, okay, if I blew up a 747 on this <laughs> film, what can we do on more? I mean, we're all working on with Alma on her next on her next project, and I think it was like a really unique collaboration. But I think the other thing for Alma is she is a writer, and she really did think as a writer and as as a true person who understood narrative arc. And I think sometimes with documentarians and some people who come from big commercials, they don't they don't truly really understand that concept of like beginning, middle, and end. Mm -hmm. And she just sort of inherently did. Mm -hmm. And so we had read something that she had written a long time ago. And that also gave us like the confidence to know like, okay, she understands that it's not just about style. It really is right. about substance storytelling being yeah. <clears throat> character. Um, so. Thank God. Right. <laughs> um, well, uh, going off of that, I mean, how do you, as producers, uh, help to facilitate the vision of you know directors like uh, Alma or you know writers and stars like Shia? I mean, what are some of the things that you have to do uh, from a practical standpoint in order to make sure that their creative vision is able to flourish on set without any hindrances? I mean, I think Anita and I were a little bit more macro in terms of like our approach and Chris was very much at Alma and Shia's right hand the entire time as well as Brian Kavanaugh Jones. Um, and I think Chris would come to us, you know, periodically, literally throughout prep and throughout the shoot and say, listen, here's what's happening. 
Shia is giving these bursts of incredible performance. They're constantly evolving. We're going to need two cameras to capture that well and in order to get, you know, be able to piece something together in the edit. There's like there's flashes of lightning and you need to be able to capture them. You need to be able to get Noah's reaction to that very thing he's doing. And those were things that were not budgeted. And, and by the way, we chose to not bond the film, which would have like constricted us a lot more. But I think like the unique group that we had assembled, we just were like, we have to trust in the process. You can't cut someone's legs off at the knees and expect them to create like great art. And so it was it was very fluid. I thank God for Anita as you know my partner in those financial decisions because I think we're both people who've been around the block a little bit and realize like in order to make something great you need to go for it. You can't commit halfway and just you know try to cut people off if it's not exactly meeting the you know original budget you set at the beginning of prep. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that was something that we, we constantly had to mm -hmm. like work and evolve to figure out. Yeah, it was great. I mean, this I, this is one of my first narrative films. And so in the documentary space, it's a little bit more of a one man band. I mean, when you're producing, you're making all the decisions. You don't have this collaborative team. And I think what was amazing is everyone came with their experiences. And, and it, I mean, what was amazing was they were on, you guys were on set a lot. I was able to constantly call Brian if he wasn't on set and you guys just constantly bouncing off ideas. And I think I got, you know, I got a lot of great feedback in, in we, while we were shooting for the stars with everything, we also, we, you do have the practical, you have to be conscious of. And I think, you know, there was great things where I remember we had all these, we had written all these amazing sequences where they're riding on a highway uh, on the bike because it, 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 and it is very important to Alma and it was very important. So we had to find ways to communicate because that was the only time that Otis would hold his father and be able to be really close without feeling this awkwardness being his dad feeling he was being a chicken hawk and kind of put off. And so we did this and I remember having this discussion, we were all like, well, we've got two of the best actors in the world. Are we going to waste two of our days doing these highway shots? So it's not always just a money conversation. It's a timing and a thought process and a what it like. It was really great because when you're by yourself, you may double down and triple down into something. But when you start to weigh it out and you have to actually pitch it to somebody, yeah. then you're like, did I just say we should spend two days with Shia and Noah on a bike when right. I could have stunt double do that right. if we really wanted to? Like, right. what are we even thinking? Right. Right. So it was like a really fun collaborative process. And again, I haven't worked in a world with like studio executives and all the other notes, but it was great to have this team where it was just like we all had a cohesive vision to yeah, start with. Yeah. And it was like, what are we going to do to achieve it together? And I think the thing I love about this team and Alma and Shia and Noah and Lucas included is everyone was, we're all like, and I think in our own right, we're a little bit of rebel, like we're rebellious, right? Like there's a way to make movies. There's a way that you come up through the studio system and you go through proper channels and blah, blah, blah. And I think this entire group, sort of by accident were like, no, let's just go for it. And like Chris had a very different perspective than we did. He came from documentary filmmaking where you really do run like run and gun a lot, you know, mm -hmm. and you don't ask permission for every single thing. And I think that's a little bit our instinct too, as well as Brian's. And so, and Alma of course is always just like wanting to push the limits on things. So I think that was like, that was the thing that sort of allowed for magic to happen because we weren't just like playing by the book all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so, anyways, we love each other. <laughs> <laughs> right, I can tell, yeah. <laughs> um, you guys also actually have a lot of multiple films out this year. Um, so I wonder um, if I could just ask all of you, I mean, what do you look for in films? And I mean, the films that you've got out this year, uh, in addition to this one, are, are also different from Honey Boy. What do you look for in projects that you say, well, I'm going to dedicate uh, all of my, my time and energy to trying to bring this to the screen? Um, I mean, for me, it's it really just comes down to the the filmmaker and the, the material, and and I always try and look for something that it feels different, like I haven't heard before. I mean, that's certainly true of Honey Boy. It was so ambitious in 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 trying to accomplish something that was that was that was unique, right? That that would catch attention and also do it uh, for a purpose, have something to say. Um, so all of those are quite essential ingredients that I look for. And, and I like, you know, I, I very much love working with newer filmmakers, like uh, like an Alma who's, you know, got this incredible experience in other uh, sides of filmmaking, but it's her first narrative. And I kind of look at track record a little differently. I think that's just more exciting to find sort of artists coming from different walks of life and uh, offering different points of views and helps me learn something. And I feel like 
audiences also respond to that when they see a breath of fresh air mm -hmm. that way. Um, so yeah. I mean, for me, the, the thing that I ask any filmmaker that comes with an idea or when we start doing internally pitching is like, why now? Why am I making this movie right now? And I think that's constantly like, even if, if like a lot the two other movies that we had this year were, you know, primarily archival based, Mike Wallace is here about the uh, mm -hmm. like, journalist. And I think right now what's more important than understanding how we got to this tipping point in the journalistic world, it's it's by seeing this man's journey through um you know, from basically the origin of news journalism when it used to be kind of this radio show vibe until now where it's completely divisive and we have, you know, an environment to Dr. Ruth with, you know, women's rights being incredibly important and being jeopardized and Planned Parenthood being worried about being defunded and watching a 92-year-old woman talk about, you know, the evolution of relationships feels really relevant right now. And so... For us, I think, you know, there's a lot of movies that when I start to look at it, I go, I love this movie, but I don't know that right now I have the answer to the why now. And I, I constantly feel like I'm waiting to either crack it through a structural thing or through some something that's going to happen in the upcoming future that's going to make this story worth telling right now. Yeah, it's funny. I'm, I'm very similar in that, you know, at my company now, we, we did Harriet and, and Honey Bear. Those are the two movies we I produced this year. And. Um, and we ask ourselves the same question, like, uh, we are always looking for novelty. What, don't follow the pack. Try to do something that people haven't seen before. And that's a way to, like, create an event. And, and the other part of that is creating an event, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. How are you going to get people out of their houses to come check this out or even to click on a button to check it out? And I think that is, like, harder and harder to do. So for us as content producers and creators, we have to really, like, do that homework. We have to do that legwork. And if we're putting our time and energy into developing something, we have to be sure that it's going to be financed on the other end or have an audience on the other end. And so it's made, I think it's made all of us better at what we do because we're going through those pieces. And I will tell you, 10 years ago, I did not do that. I was just trying to make whatever I could make. You know, if I liked a script, I would try to produce it. Mm -hmm. um, and now, and now it's a different world. And, um, and so. Well, thank you all so much for your time. Uh, congratulations on your work on Honey Boy. Uh, it's a really powerful and uh, moving film, and uh, you know I'm uh, glad to have had the chance to talk to you about it. Thank, well, thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for great. taking the time. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thanks to all of you at home for watching. Make sure you hit the uh, like and subscribe button below, and make sure you visit us at goldderby.com for all the latest Oscar news.